So, okay, good. We have a growing number of students here. Um, Mark, I'll just kind of go ahead and say um, some things that, of course, these folks already know um, that you may or may not, but this is our Legs Applied Ethology Family Dog Mediation Professional Course Membership Group. Um, we've got close to a thousand students now internationally. Usually we get about 50 attending each of these <coughs> Q&A sessions and um, we have been uh, really thrilled about how this group has been um, conversing and collaborating so far. Uh, quite unique within the dog behavior and training industry. We have been able to avoid a lot of the contentious rabbit hole arguments and debates about methodology that um, just uh, watch us kind of all decline into a pit of um, uh, arguing ideologies on, on either side of the fence. And so um, it's been really nice to have the true spirit of science represented here as far as um, respectful discourse and dialogue about various principles and different scientific disciplines and really exploring the nooks and crannies of all the other relevant scientific disciplines outside of ABA and applied behavior analysis. Um, and so I've been very proud of this, this group. Um, we have a, a wide, uh, di diverse background of members here. Um, and not everyone is actually even practicing in the field of dog behavior and training. Um, we have folks in academia, um, folks with backgrounds in other behavioral sciences unrelated to dogs, um, and folks, of course, in sheltering, veterinary medicine, um, people that are kind of starting a second career in life and, and whatnot. So um, we are aiming to elevate and evolve the conversation uh, within the dog behavior and training community. And your work, of course, has been a valuable contribution to what uh, we are able to enjoy in our insights and understanding as a result. So um, some folks were asking about cognitive ethology, and I said, well, why don't we ask the man himself to come and talk to us about that and answer your questions. So that's why we have you here today and we're so grateful for your time, so. Well, thank you. It's, it's good to be here. I'm just looking at some notes I have. Good. <laughs> um, yeah, um, so is that my cue to start? Yes, if you, if you would like to, I, I was just gonna say, you know, um, I, I know we had mentioned in the email that we uh, had uh, both felt like there'd been some real progress in the last few years in the industry. Um, and so uh, I, I know that folks would love to hear your thoughts on that and frankly, anything you had to say. So yes, I'll, I'll let you go here. Okay. Um, well, what I'm doing now is I'm looking at notes. So what I was thinking to do, because I get a lot out of these things um, too, of course, is maybe just begin with a brief introduction to some just general ideas. And then one way that I've been um, laying out um, just some discussions about who dogs are and what they do and why they do what they do is to um, go through a, a list of myths about dogs. Um, because I think that's highly pertinent to what you all do. Um, and, and, some of the myths are really dangerous to um, dangerous to dogs because they misrepresent dogs, and they also um, I don't know I, it, I'm not sure I had a word it other than it screws up the human dog relationship and humans have come away with different expectations of who dogs are and um, I don't know what they're supposed to do in certain situations. Does that sound okay? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. That sounds wonderful. And, um, and I'm sure that will open up a conversation and a bunch of questions that other folks have. Yeah, I mean, it's not going to be a very long presentation. And I really want to hear from you because you all are on the ground, if you will. I'm not a dog trainer. And, you know, I'm a former academic and academics can do anything they want because no <laughs> one holds them accountable to anything. But, um, but, but I will say that I think that um, a lot of what I talk about really is, um, it, I mean, I think it's highly related to uh, dog training or dog teaching and um, educating people about dogs. So just a couple of things. Um, so I, my train, I'm really a field biologist. And so when I started studying dogs, I was also doing field studies of coyotes and I've studied wolves and penguins in Antarctica and birds near my house in the mountains outside of Boulder. So I, the view I take to dog behavior is looking at dogs as cod-carrying mammals. Um, 
a lot of people historically, and I don't know if, if some today do, have looked at dogs as sort of, um, how would you say it? Um, as artifacts, you know, human, human created beings or creatures. So, you know, we select for traits we, we like, whether or not they're deleterious to the dogs themselves, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so as a biologist, I'm interested in how different behavior patterns evolve um, and, what, and how, how they help dogs adapt to certain situations. So really what that means is that um, what are the behavior patterns good for? Um, what, what purpose do they serve? Because they adapt, they, they evolve because they allowed individuals to adapt to certain situations. I mean, and um, people forget that, that there's some adaptive value to why dogs, why dogs play the way they do, why they have evolved certain facial expressions and tail positions and different vocalizations um, and, and things like that. And we call them behavioral phenotypes. So phenotype usually is a word that refers to what an organism looks like. Um, it's observable characteristics. And if you think of behavior as a phenotype, then it means it's um, something tangible on which natural selection, selection, obviously human artificial selection um, can have an effect, you know, hence different breeds of dogs, for example, who are bred for different sorts of um, reasons and dogs who, are, who look really differently and, you know, breeding dogs who can't breathe, who can't mate on their own, who can't give birth and, you know, things like that, because it's good for the humans, but, you know, surely not good for um, the dogs. So one of the big things that I'm really interested in too would be uh, dangers of normalizing dog behavior. And I'll get back to that and I'll say more about, you know, the fact that each dog is an individual and um, we need to be very, very careful about drawing realizations. You know, when people say dogs are X or dogs do or don't do Y and when I hear that, because I study a lot of free ranging dogs and I go to dog parks a lot, I, I go, gosh, I mean, I just saw that, you know, 20 times yesterday. Um, I think a lot of that stems from the fact that a lot of people don't know that, you know, around 25% of the dogs in the world are what we would call homed dogs. So they're dogs who have a pretty reliable place to live and they get food and veterinary care and um, they get a comfortable bed and they also get over controlled by helicopter humans who basically most of the time say, no, don't do this, or no, we don't do this, or stop that, or stop doing this. And it's estimated that there's probably about a billion dogs in the world now. And of that number, you know, give or take 750 million, give or take 75% are who we would call free ranging or feral dogs. So it's, it's just important that a lot of what comes our way in terms of dog behavior come from an extremely small cohort of dogs who live highly compromised and highly controlled lives. Um, and, and I think that's important to remember. You know, so one extension of that, of course, is that um, a lot of land studies have done on dogs and some of them are really good science it's not i'm not critical of the science but I'm just very cautious about drawing conclusions from you know a handful of dogs who are studied in a particular location by particular people so i i stress all the time that the science is good in most cases sometimes it's not all that good but once again we're drawing conclusions about what dogs do or don't do or why they do something or even how they do it from very small populations of dogs. And, and, there, and I just read something yesterday, I can't remember where, but you know the importance of being very careful about using studies from labs to um, motivate 
practical applications of how we interact with dogs. And I'll get back to that in a bit. Um, so I think that that's really a very important thing. And, you know, one of the things um, that, that I always say, you know, I, I wrote a little essay about it is um, while we know a lot about dog behavior, um, there's a lot we don't know. And it seems like the more I know, the more I say I don't know. And people get really, really frustrated. And, and you all might, you know, have that happen too. And I get countless emails of people describing some situations that would be much more apropos for you to deal with because I'm not a dog trainer, but I, I know enough about dog behavior to make some guesses <clears throat> about what's going on. But I always tell them, look, you know, number one, I'm not a dog trainer. And number two, I need to see what's happening, if you will, you know, in vitro. I, I mean, I really need to see what your dog is doing that you want to correct or stop and the interactions that you have with your dog. And they get it. And I always say to them, go find, you know, a local, you know, if you can, and I hope you can find a local positive um, force-free trainer and let them come see what's going on. And a lot of trainers I know out here, and I know people elsewhere, you know, at least early on, spend a lot of time talking to the human as well to understand who they are, because um, dogs often reflect the, say, the behavior and personality of um, their guardian, their human. Okay, so you know all of that. Um, so let me just run through a couple of these, um, a few of these myths. Um, number one, there's no universal dog, so. I get really upset when I see general statements that dogs do this or don't do that. Okay. I mean, you know, dogs breathe, all dogs have to breathe. So that's one general characteristic of living organisms. But I think we just need to pay, we need to pay much more attention to individual personalities, temperaments, um, idiosyncrasies. And I think that that's what's kept me going for decades because I always wanted to know about the dogs or wolves or coyotes that didn't do what maybe most other dog wolves or coyotes did. Okay. And, you know, a lot of times when people do statistics on dog behavior and other aspects of behavior, they look for trends and they'll go something was statistically significant at the 0.05 level, which is fine. But it only applies to those dogs studied in those conditions by those people in a particular experiment. <clears throat> and it doesn't account for the outliers, the dogs who didn't do what was, didn't do what most of the other dogs did. Okay, so I think paying attention to the dogs who don't do certain things is equally, if not more important for um, furthering our knowledge about dog behavior. Um, another is that dogs are our best friends. I mean, it sells a lot of books. It sells a lot of magazine articles, but, but dogs aren't our best friends. I mean, globally, dog abuse is really rampant. It's rampant in the United States. So it doesn't mean that some dogs aren't our best friends, but, you know, once again, you know, and, and I know some of you have, but, you know, if I say to people, if you ever rescued a dog, no. fostered a dog, you know, got a dog who had had a difficult upbringing, you would know that, you know, they're not our best friends. They were mistreated severely, in some cases, heinously. Um, so we need to be careful about that um, because it sometimes sets up expectations, um, you know, that we just can't match. You know, I mean, we don't do certain, well, I hope we don't do certain things to our best friends that we routinely would do to um, dogs. Um, another is that dogs are unconditional lovers. A they're not. I mean, once again, if you've had a dog who's had a, a, a terrible childhood, if you will, then um, they don't unconditionally love people. They're very selective, in fact. And I'm sure you all have a lot of ex more examples than I do, but, you know, I see it all the time. I, a couple of years ago, this guy in Boulder uh, at a dog park I'd go to 
a lot rescued um, two real young puppies who were found on the side of a road in Texas. They were litter mates and they were vastly different. He brought them after having them and making sure that they were all okay, he brought them to the dog park. And one of them was just a love muffin who ran up and wanted to play with all the dogs and interact with all the humans. And the other one was scared blankless and wouldn't do anything. And it took almost six months for him to warm up to me as well. Um, so they're not unconditional lovers. I get emails, and maybe you do too, of people saying, you know, I'm trying to do all I can for my dog, but my dog doesn't love me. What's wrong with the dog? And I usually want to at least, you know, say, well, maybe what's wrong with you? But I don't because I'm a nice guy. Um, and I'll say, well, there's nothing wrong with the dog, at least that I can tell. You know, I mean, I'm not there. But give your dog a chance to warm up to you. Maybe the dog had a bad upbringing. Maybe the dog had a bad dream. You know, people will say, God, my dog woke up yesterday and it's very different or there's been some radical changes. So maybe they had a dog nightmare. I mean, dogs dream, they can have bad dreams and they can have bad days just like humans can. So I think that those are the two overriding myths that I'm very, um, I'm, I'm very critical of because neither, neither is true. Um, some people think dogs only need food, a warm bed, and a safe place to rest. I mean, that's only part of the equation. Dogs are highly social animals and they need a lot of contact and socialization and social contact. But having said that, that doesn't mean that they don't vary among one another, you know, and that some need or want more than others. Um, and that it's really important to take that into account that um, I've had dogs just want downtime. They want to get away from me. I don't take it personally. I don't know why they do. Some of them, some I can imagine why knowing, uh, say, <clears throat> excuse me, knowing what their lives were like before I um, met them. But the fact of the matter is they're telling you they need downtime and alone time just like we do. And all the dogs I've known who have needed that kind of space when they came out of it, they were just like they were before they went into it. They just needed less stim. They, maybe they were being overstimulated or they just didn't like something that was going on. And it's also giving a dog control and agency over what they want to do and what we allow them to do. Because I've heard people go, no, 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 don't go away. I want you here. And I'm thinking the dog is telling you they don't want to be here now. So let them go away. And there's nothing wrong with a dog. I, th I think that that's very important is allowing dogs, especially confined dogs, to have a lot more control and make choices about how they use time and space. Without, you know, once again, without taking it personally, I always say it's not all about us. Um, and, 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 and I think most people get that. Um, another is dogs don't display dominance, which to me, it's just dumb. I mean, I don't know how that ever got into the literature, but there's no animals who don't display some form of dominance or some sorts of social relationships that are somewhat hierarchical. But that doesn't give people license to dominate dogs. And I think that um, when I got into this business, thank goodness, I was talking to dog trainers who... <laughs> had were enlightened if you will i in my humble opinion but you know i'd say why do people do this and you know one person they point to of course is caesar milan you know and others who dominate dogs you can get a dog you can get a dog or or a child or another human being to do exactly what you want them to do by being in their face and being assertive and dominance but it doesn't mean that they've really changed deep down in their own heads and hearts um to become if you will the individual who you um, want them to be. But um, there's just no examples of any social mammal I know who does not form some sort of social relationships that can be hierarchical. So, I mean, this is one of my early entries um, in which I really pissed off some trainers because they like, was getting emails that were not nice, if you will. 
And, um, and, and I didn't understand why. I said, my God, I've been studying animals for decades. And, you know, even penguins have these hierarchies and they recognize one another as individuals. And then someone said, gee, the reason it is, is because then people want to become the leader of the pack, whatever that means, and use forceful measures. Um, so, so I think that's a big myth that needs to be, and I think slowly but surely it's being um, done away with. Um, another is that dogs don't feel guilt. There still hasn't been a good study of guilt. People cite Alex Horowitz's work where she found with 12 dogs. I mean, and I don't mean that as a criticism. I was one of her mentors, but the fact of the matter is she didn't say people, sorry, she didn't say dogs don't feel guilt. She said, we're not very good at reading it. And I've written a whole lot of things and with quotes from her. It's really important because just a few days ago, I was talking to somebody and they said, well, we know that dogs don't feel jealousy or guilt. So, and I went, oh, really? And um, how do you know this? And the fact of the matter is, nobody's really studied guilt systematically that way. The jealousy argument is interesting because a couple of years ago, there was a study done using neuroimaging that set up situations in which you would expect dogs to feel jealous, giving a dog seeing another dog getting food, for example. And the same part of the brain in the dog fired as does in humans when humans can say I'm feeling jealous and and I really like that study because it was designed to study jealousy in pre-verbal kids or very young kids well I don't know that dogs are pre-verbal but because they can't say oh yeah I'm feeling jealous just like a young kid the data that came out of studying dogs was very similar to the data that came out for young humans. So once again, I mentioned that because I, I was surprised at a lot of this, but when I talked to, like I said, enlightened dog trainers, you know, there's people who don't like using word, you know, emotionally packed words. I mean, submission, appeasement, even joy and, and, and pleasure. And I'm thinking, well, that's just dumb to me. I mean, these emotions have evolved. These states of mind have evolved. It's not a matter of if they've evolved, it's a matter of why they evolved, what they're good for. And they have extremely powerful explanatory significance. You know, if you tell me you're watching dogs play and they're enjoying themselves, I may not be able to fill in the details, but I have a pretty damn good idea of what's going on between these dogs and what they're feeling. Or likewise, if one dog is threatening a dog or is resource guarding or something like that, <laughs> I get a good picture of what's going on. Does it mean I have a perfect picture? No. Does it mean I know enough that maybe I could help if a problem arose? Yes, it does. But that's where you get back to the fact that there's no universal dog. And I'm, I know you all know this, but you need to tweak your methods to a, a dog's individual um, personality and quirks. Dogs are quirky like humans. And so they may do something, just keep doing certain things and then all of a sudden they don't or they do something different. And once again, you know, I get emails from people saying, my goodness, maybe they're not feeling well. You know, maybe something's happened. And I'm saying, well, maybe they just, <laughs> they just are doing what they feeling, they feel like they need to do. You know, they're not carbon copies every day. Um, and wow. trainers I've talked to have said that, that when they say a problem, they don't mean it in a negative way, but that's really a challenge, maybe not a problem of understanding each individual dog for who they are. So that just gets back to that there's no universal or um, prototype dog. Um, some people write articles that dogs are like Zen dogs, they live in the present, but we know that that's not true at all. I mean, once again, just think about dogs who have had horrific or very good upbringings. Um, they're not just in the present, and dogs think about the future. There's so many studies that show this, that they anticipate certain behavioral responses from humans. Um, they're following the course of a tennis ball or a Frisbee. There's something going on in their brains 
that they're thinking about the future. Um, bless you. But once again, I don't, I don't know. I don't know where that came. I don't know where that, that one myth came from. Um, but um, you still see it and, and you still hear about it. So it means that dogs live from moment to moment. So nothing that happened before is influencing their behavior. And they're not thinking about what might happen, you know, a couple of seconds or minutes or hours down the line when, when you, we, know, um, we know they are. Um, another is dogs don't like to be hugged. There was an article that said, don't hug dogs. And I just thought that was dumb. I mean, some dogs like it, some dogs don't. If your dog likes to be touched and hugged, do it. If your dog doesn't like to be touched and hugged, find someone or something else to touch or hug. Um, but there was an article that basically, you know, you do in their terms, of course, but, but there was an article that really, um, you know, said don't hug dogs. Um, and likewise, there was another article that said dogs shouldn't sleep in bedrooms or in bed with people. And once again, if your dog likes it and you like it, I think it's just fine. If your dog likes it and you don't like it, well, there's a problem there. If you like it and they don't like it, there's a big problem there. But what got me in this essay, I think it was in the New York Times actually, it, it highlighted two groups of dogs that said that young dogs and old sick dogs could be problematic and maybe you wouldn't want them in your bedroom to keep you up. And I'm thinking, my goodness, those would be the animals you want near you. And after I wrote my article, I had a whole bunch of emails from people who I don't know saying that, you know, in some cases, their dogs sleeping near them saved the dog's life. Dog, one, in one case, the dog woke up gasping for air. In other, the dog was clearly having a stroke. And if the dog was in another room or not near the people, they would never have known this. So once again, the bottom line here and for other examples is if your dog likes it and you like it, do it. You know, there was this article, I think it was also in the New York Times. I don't know, the New York Times tends to publish so much junk anyway, but, but saying all dog parks are bad. I mean, it actually said that. Well, all dog parks aren't bad. Some are and some aren't. So... If your dog likes to go to the dog park and you do go. And you know, once again, you get into this binary. If they like it and you don't like it, I say to people, bend over and take your dog to the dog park. If your dog doesn't like it and you like it, then I tell people, go without your dog. I mean, you know, for whatever reason you like your dog park. And this stuff just seems so logical to me. But people sometimes you know, not only in dog behavior and dog training, but in life in general, like these binary type of things. Something's either all good or all bad, or all right or all wrong. And that just ignores the individuality of the dog, the human, and the relationship they have. And I like to say that, you know, dogs have individual personalities. Humans do, and so too do dog-human relationships that there's a personality to a dog-human relationship. And I don't see why we can't call it that. It basically means that there's just certain patterns. It's like the patterns you set up with other human beings. You know, you, we have certain predictable patterns and it's not bad, it's just what is. And we have different patterns with different, say other humans, no, no different than you would have um, for dogs. Um, let's see. Oh, some people think it's okay to give dogs as gifts. And of course it's not, you know, and somebody said to me, well, I want to give someone a gift, but if I ask him, if I want a dog, they'll know I'm giving them a dog and I'm saying, so what? It's a good gesture, <laughs> you know? And if they don't want the dog, you won't, they won't be dumping the dog, abandoning it. Um, things like that. And there are some programs of giving dogs as gifts that I think are just ludicrous. Um, in other words, don't play tug of war with your dog because it's, it's, it do, it's, it's a, it's, um, you're allowing your dog to dominate you if you play tug of war. I mean, oh, how silly, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, it, yeah, I mean, I'm just going through stuff, you know, um, peeing is always scent marking. No, it's not. Dogs just pee sometimes because they have to pee. 
They're not markings, but sometimes they do mark. But I will get things saying, you know, my dog is marking my living room and I'm going, Oh, well, tell me more. And a lot of the times it's that the dog has a full bladder. The person was on the phone or gone all day. The dog gets up and is happy. And the first thing, their, <laughs> their kidneys explode and they just pee. So they're not marking something in the living room to say this is mine. They just have to pee. But I, th I think that's important because, um, because once again, you know, sometimes I, I have a friend and I really like him. But, you know, he, he's, he when he's with his dog, he's really good. But sometimes he leaves him and he, the dog got uh, one day, the dog must have eaten something and got really thirsty, drank a huge bucket of water. My friend came home. The dog was really happy to see him. And of course, you know what happened. He just peed all over my friend's leg. And, and, and my friend got really upset. And thank goodness he called me and he said, he loves you. He's happy to see you. But he was alone for a bunch of hours and he drank a bucket of water. You know, um, anyway, um, I think that's important um, about dogs don't dream. In fact, I just did a um, just did an interview yesterday. That I think there's going to be an interesting article coming out in the Atlantic um, pretty soon about dog dreaming and, you know, why, why are dogs, you know, when they're in REM sleep, usually, you know, are they chasing a rabbit or chasing a deer? I don't know. But if the woman who interviewed me had really read up on it. It was really interesting, you know, that, you know, there's no reason to think dogs as mammals don't dream. Do we have access to what they dream about? No, but a couple of years ago, there was a really interesting study of rats where they recorded brain waves while they were learning a maze. And so they had a certain pattern of brain waves. And then they recorded the EEG when the rats were sleeping in their cage. I'm, I'm against this kind of research. Let me tell you, I don't like caging rats. But what was interesting is the EKG, the, sorry, the EEG for the sleeping rats was the same as the EEG in the maze. And a lot of, you know, the inference there, and I think they're right, is that there was some kind of memory consolidation. I mean, the rats were replaying in their brain while they were sleeping, running through the maze. Um, there's no reason to think dogs might not do that as well. So um, those are my myths. I mean, I don't know. Somebody tell me that you don't like something I said. That's how I learn when people go, oh, you're just, you're just full of it. <laughs> so, Is it okay um, if I just agree with you about a bunch of things instead and then talk about how we've been having some of these same conversations? Yeah, in the go ahead because I, because I was going to conclude with something, but yeah. Let, no, go, go ahead if you want to. No, 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 I'm tired of listening to myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I just, I, I'm sure a bunch of people were kind of at the edge of their seat buzzing with, yes, we've been talking about this and in so many ways, so many of the things that you brought up and touched on. Um, and I think the kind of starting point for all of those details um, is that you're putting things in a context, and that's what we're trying to do, putting them in a global context, right? Mm -hmm. Like yep. in an evolutionary context, in yep. a social animal context, um, mm -hmm. it, rather than what you uh, set us up to, to consider as this um, false uh, set of expectations and um, value assignments and labels that we have for our dogs as pets, right? Mm -hmm. That we have all these expectations about what they should be doing. Um, and like you said, we have this idea of the dog. And then we furthermore have an idea of a good dog and a bad dog. And it's mm -hmm. like trainers were scripted historically to move them to the good dog column and mm -hmm. um, make sure they're not in the bad dog column. Um, mm -hmm. And and we as a culture, basically in modern developed nations, as you um, described, is so different than what you know is the reality in un underdeveloped or developing nations where dogs are still living as world dogs in free roaming kinds of environments and habitat conditions. Uh -huh. um, but that the the captivity, the loss of agency, the presumptions and expectations that we have about our dogs in terms of their behavior. The idea that they should do and should be and shouldn't be all these things that you just debunked for us, right, is all of those myths, is yep. very much why we are so kind of divorced from dogs within this context of all of these other natural laws. 
And our industry historically, as you and I have kind of commiserated about in the past, Mark, is, is partly responsible for that because mm -hmm. we've continued to kind of put dogs in this space where they're like the exception to all natural law. And if we only train them right, if we only apply the principles of applied behavior analysis, then we can manipulate their behavior to the ends that we want for our goals um, of what we want them to do or not do. And the homogenization of all of the different, quite varied phenotypes that we have within the dog population, as well as within the incredible range of just individual differences, of course, that we have in the populations within even all of those breed groups and breeds, it leads us to highly oversimplify Mm -hmm. what the dog is, what they should be and what they shouldn't be, which sets our entire society up for these expectations that lead to frustration, disappointment, confusion, um, you know, exasperation, uh, abuse, as you say as well. Um, mm -hmm. And so what we are so working to do entirely in the vein of everything that you just explained is to put dogs in a context for our profession and for our culture so that we can be honest and comprehensive in terms of our understanding um, of the incredible complexity of them as um, a, a species that is in fact a biological species where the other you know, natural laws do in fact apply to them too. Yep. Um, and, and also recognize the ways that we've offended that and, and start thinking of ways to clean it up. Um, as you say, with artificial selection, um, you said very uh, well that we um, are, where's that wonderful quote, dogs are human artifacts selecting for what we like, even if it is deleterious to the dog. I mean, that is something we talk a lot about, right? That nature mm -hmm. selects for what's functional for the animal and has value mm -hmm. for the animal's adaptation and success. And humans have interrupted that core natural process with dogs so that there are so many dogs that just from the day that they're born, frankly, are carrying traits that may be deleterious for them physically or behaviorally in some way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so anyway, that's that's my kind of summary of gratitude for everything that you just said and a celebration for this group of people who is in fact struggling with and wrestling with these questions. And we've gotten increasingly comfortable with saying, we don't know and that's okay. So. Yeah, I mean, the next word that I was going to say really was context. That's mm -hmm. my sort of wrapping it up that from my point of view as a field biologist, I don't think it's much different from yours, actually, but who the dog is, who they're interacting with, where it's happening, location, you know, so for a dog, it could be at home, could it be at the dog park, could it be, you know, in their backyard, or, you know, there's something called the residency effect that gives dogs and other animals some kind of confidence when they're on their own turf. Um, but context also means who else they're interacting, what's their personality, uh, the, the, the context of um, the human, the context of the dog human relationship. So I, I use context in a huge, if, if you will, in a big way, mm -hmm. but it's really critical because as you said, that can explain away, you know, a lot of, or, or explain a lot of individual variations in what we would hope would be a more simple system. Mm -hmm. And we're not, you know, and people say, well, you're just complicating it. Um, no, no, not, I mean, you're not. I mean, when I studied coyotes, there were a pack of coyotes living on one side of a butte in, um, outside of Jackson, Wyoming, and two kilometers down the road, there was another pack, and you couldn't, the social structure of each was so different, you would have thought you were watching different animals. Mm -hmm. Same with the wolves in Yellowstone. Mm -hmm. They're pack, they form packs, they form large packs, small packs, and the social dynamics can be rather different. Mm -hmm. So once again, you know, people like the simplistic binary type thing, you know, good, bad, right, wrong. You know, I wrote down what you said, should, should, and well, in certain situations, pe humans, as well as dogs and other animals do things that maybe they shouldn't do, but it's the most, it's the most adaptive thing for them to do to get through a situation. Mm -hmm. You know, would we want it to be part of their regular repertoire? No, but maybe that's their way of coping, right. you know, or dealing with um, a challenging um, situation.
So um, I, I think that's a big part of what we're trying to do here, too, as most of us being dog behavior and training professionals kind of historically up to this moment where we found each other in this collective of legs is to reframe should and shouldn't good and bad into, you know, and therefore the kind of training model, which is I then get to say what's good, bad, right, wrong, you know, should, shouldn't. And then my yeah. job is to manipulate your behavior instead this mediation model teaches us to sit squarely between the legs of the dog parties and the people parties and sort out the needs, the motivations, um, the experiences, uh, the traits and characteristics, et cetera, of both to help each one as a guide, right? Instead of a conditioner of behavior, find the solutions that will be the most valuable and functional for them. Yep, yeah, I mean, you know, you said it more succinctly than I might, but, you know, it's basically you're entering into a give and take relationship and you'd like to have it be as symmetrical as it can. Mm -hmm. And like any relationship, you sometimes give more than you get and sometimes you get more than you give, but you hope over a certain amount of time, it'll be sort of 50-50. Well, you at know. least in value, right? Even if, like you said, like going back yeah. to the whole dominance myth, right? And people saying that that's not a thing. There's an interesting kind of nature to our relationships with dogs because of captivity, because we've created a false set of conditions in a sense in that they are by definition dependence on us yes. because of yep. the way it's set up, right? They don't have the autonomy to go adapt with someone else, somewhere else, et cetera. So then we're in the position of kind of being the parent, upper management, explainer, provider, however you want to look at it. And by default, of course, we then have control of resources, which starts to put it in this kind of um, dominance from an ethology perspective kind of arrangement, if you will, because we can give and we can take. And we have a lot of power as a result of that, that we need to be mindful of in terms of how to be that provider in a way that is um, uh, acknowledging the equal value of the dog, even though the, the dynamic that we have because of pet conditions and captivity does create some imbalances, right? That we have to then just kind of recognize mm -hmm. and move forward with. Yep, no, I mean, you, you got it. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's exactly, it's exactly what it is. Um, you know, I, I always write about, you know, there's, there's human appropriate and dog appropriate behavior, but a lot of dog appro appropriate behavior like humping and mounting and, you know, sniffing groins and all that, um, that's normal dog behavior. Mm -hmm. And I say to people, I mean, you know, that's what, that's what dogs do, right. you know, so you're, you know, I, all I can, all I say is because you know you, if you start talking to some people, all they want to do is beat the hell out of you because you're criticizing them, and it just gets all too complex in these mm -hmm. day and age. Or they'll write something on some social media that somebody told me that it's okay for my dog to hump their leg or something. I don't know, whatever. But <laughs> I, I, I experience this like this a lot, and maybe you do too. Yeah. But the fact, but the fact of the matter is, you know. These dogs are just trying to express their dogness, if you will. I mean, that's why Jessica Pierce and I wrote our book, Unleashing Your Dog. The whole basis is that dogs are captive animals. It's not meant in a pejorative way. Right. They are. They just are. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, take a dog on a walk and you know, you hear this all the time. People go, Wait, what are you sniffing? There's nothing there. You know, and the dog is going, oh, my goodness, this is like a, 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 a symphony yeah. of smells. And, yeah. Or what are you looking at? Or why are you cocking your head? Do you have a bad neck? No, I'm <laughs> trying to locate a sound or, or something like that. Yeah. So, so the trade-off is really, you know, the trade-off is giving um, your dog the most degrees of freedom that you can to do doggy mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. you know and and i don't mean i don't really care if dogs hump one another at a dog park and some, actually i'm learning a lot of people don't care either it's just that you know they see they see the sex side of it they don't see the play or the or it's not necessarily dominance you know and then they'll say well wild animals don't do that oh good lord <laughs> i mean that, it's of course they do 
I mean, dogs didn't invent humping and mounting <laughs> and stuff, but um, but but you know, it's stuff like that, and dogs pick up a lot of information um with their noses, of course. You know, they're amazing organs, and so dogs will put their noses where we don't want them to, and. I guess the thing I always feel is, and I say to people, because it sounds dire, but I don't mean it, that if you're gonna if you're gonna rob your app, if you're gonna rob the dog of the opportunity to exercise their senses, then you may have a problem there. And I wrote about a woman who I used to see at one of the local dog parks who was a clinical psychologist. And one day she said to me, You think that dogs suffer from being olfactorily deprived? I said, maybe. I hadn't thought of it that way, but they're getting, they're just getting a half a picture. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I'm looking at something, someone that I want to learn more about it and somebody has a rope around my neck and they're coming, come on, there's nothing there. And I'm going, no, there's a lot there. I just have not processed it. So yeah. I think dogs can be getting a lot of incomplete information mm -hmm. and then they're basing their behavior on the incompleteness of the information. Mm -hmm. And because they're doing that, they may do the thing that is absolutely appropriate, but we wouldn't know that because number one, we don't have the same sensory capacities. And number two, we have no idea what's going on. Right. And just, you know, in, in that sense that we would recognize it for wild animals or any other animal that may be living in zoos and on farms that they, of course, have these needs to have A, the sensory signals in the environment fit their uh their neuroethology right so that like that makes sense and they can recognize with any kind of semblance of like cohesion what the world and the signals in their world mean and then of course in nature that would give them an opportunity to then in the right conditions express the re relevant behaviors for those conditions and as yep. you say, dogs are so like, they're, they're having a difficult time in the modern world, A, understanding the signals in their environment, B, because of captivity and are further interrupting in their ability to process the information, and then C, in their ability to act in a way based on their processing that feels functional, valuable, intuitive, instinctual to them. Yep. And it's it, the level of offense to the interruption of that natural system is so undervalued in the dog world where we have enough scientific evidence of the importance of this and the five freedoms and all these other species. And frankly, we're, dogs are kind of the last to get our attention on it because I think we have a hard time perceiving yeah. that they're having welfare issues, right? Because they're just living in the lap of luxury. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, Jessica Pierce and some other people have written about that, right? What are you complaining about? You know, I give you crappy dog food, the same thing every day. And I give you a pillow to lie on that you like, but it's boring. And I take you on the same walks every day and I don't allow you to sniff or listen for sounds. What are you complaining about? I'm going, oh, good Lord. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, I, I'd like to think things are changing. I, I don't know. I, I don't. I, I don't know. I mean, I know dog trainers I know um, out here are busier than busy. And I think and, it's getting worse in the meantime, frankly. I think the dog behavior yeah. problems are increasing because of everything that we've talked about and the dysfunction of all of that. Mm -hmm. And as our world gets busier and we're more and more delusioned about what a dog is and, and all of that, then what's happening is, is that the, the behavior problems are increasing as we get busier and the captivity increases, et cetera. And so far until very recently, our industry of behavior experts has only offered applied behavior analysis, behavior modification, some enrichment, which is good, right? But like not enough, not enough to begin to um, get to the bottom of, of the dysfunction and what's actually happening. Um, I would love to open the floor to you guys too. Yeah. You guys, while we have Mark, I'll shut up and you guys can ask some questions. I know you've got some, raise your virtual hand as we usually do. Um, <laughs> and I'll let you guys, uh, you know, give, uh, give Mark the opportunity to answer your awesome questions. Please. I know we've got some bold people in this group now. Don't be shy, y'all. Come on. <laughs> I'm going to start calling on people. 
I know um, some of you. All right, there we go. There we go. All right, Bridget. Okay. Um, I what my interest was piqued when you were mentioning briefly the residency effect, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that and what all is known about it. Yeah, I mean, what it, what it basically means is that animals, when they're at home, just it could be they they're more familiar with their turf and or they're more confident. So like it's been studied in fishes, some birds, um, I think some mam. Well, I mean, you can see it in, in mammals, even if it's not studied, like when a wolf or a coyote or another animal is on their own territory, they seem to be bolder um, and more confident. But um, there's been some interesting experiments with fishes where you can set up a situation where um, the only variable that changes is where the animals are. And you can have, you know, Harry and Sam, and depending where they are, one dominates the other. So that I mean, that's basically what it's like. And I've heard, I've had some trainers, I mean, no one, I don't know if there's ever been a formal study of it in dogs, but, but I hear stories all the time at dog parks. My dog likes a certain area because he know, you know, the, somebody has described it, he likes a certain area because he feels better there, meaning he may feel more confident. Um, and and um, so that's basically what the residency effect is. It's interesting because I've also seen it with dogs entering a space in a different order. Um, and then the interactions once they're in the space are different depending on who was already occupying the space and who was the one entering the space. Oh. That's fascinating. Yeah, there you go. I mean, so the residency effect does not have to only apply to this is my home. It could be first come, first serve, and whoever yeah, there okay. first is, so interesting. The, is the animal who has more confidence, right? Yeah, even if it isn't like my dog's home, if he's going to my friend's house for a play date, if he's existing in the yard already when a new dog enters, totally different from if he's entering and doesn't matter if it's a total, totally new dog, he's fine if he's the last one in the yard. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's why sometimes um, people have introduced dogs um, like coming into, say, a neutral area from both sides mm -hmm. rather than saying, oh, I'm going to bring Harry over to meet Mary and oh, it's at Mary's yard. Entering. OK. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. I don't know of any data on that, but I definitely get the feeling every now and again watching playgroups form. Mm -hmm. that sometimes they really form m more smoothly when dogs just sort of come together and they just start playing. You know, sometimes it's hard, you know, you'll have this little outlier barking and wanting to join the group and, you know, the other dogs are saying, sorry, you're too small, you're too big, you're too ugly, you're not smart <laughs> enough, whatever exclusionary um, <laughs> reasons they have. But I think that one of the reasons these groups can form so fast spontaneously is because maybe there is none of this, if you will, situational residency effect. Cool. Yeah, okay. no, that's a good question. Yep. Yeah, super interesting. And um, that'll be a fun offshoot, I'm sure, for our chat in the group, um, because I know we all play a lot of like orchestrating of how we present different situations and training mm -hmm. plans and behavior plans. You know, um, I, I think most of us have found out the hard way, the difference between thinking about that and not thinking about it when we're introducing dogs and people to dogs and all of that stuff. So, right. um, yeah, great question, Bridget. Um, yep. Okay, so Lena. So Lena, um, if we believe that dogs solidify their memories when they're sleeping in REM sleep, if we have a dog who's had a traumatic event, what do we think about providing them after the event, before they sleep, with drugs like benzodiazepine or propranolol that in theory will mitigate or inhibit those memories from forming in the brain? Yeah, boy, that, I, I, I can't answer, I have no idea. I mean, you know, because there are some people who, uh, there are some people for humans who say that it's important for them to play them out, you know, to get, you know, if you will, get, get through them. Mm -hmm. um, Nick Dodman, who's a very, very well-known vet, he wrote a book called 
the dog on the couch or something like that, you know, because he's been a real proponent of using, you know, certain drugs to deal with certain psycho, um, psychological, um, you know, disorders, um, you know, um, and um, I, I personally might do the same thing for a dog that I might do for a human if I read them to be in a certain situation. Like if it's just so traumatic, um, you know, and you, you can tell, it might be nice to do away um, with the trauma. Um, and, I, and I know for humans, sometimes taking certain drugs or certain practices can lessen, if you will, the trauma, but it doesn't get rid of it totally. Your, your question is a great one because it's really based on if dogs are doing this kind of thing, you know, in their sleep, mm -hmm. you know, when they're dreaming, say. Um, and, and we've you know, heard, we've all heard about, you know, the dog was attacked by the bigger dog and how different that dog's behavior is after the attack. Yep, yep. You wonder if, if there's a way to mitigate that, assuming that they're, you know, physically stable to take these drugs. Yeah, I'll bet you there are. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, this is not my field, but, but yeah. I mean, you know, if if a human being has been abused, and there's some way you can lessen the, the why not do it for a dog? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I yeah, yeah. I yeah. I totally agree with you. Um, I mean, one of the things I was going to say before, which is at a completely different level, um, is you know, humans helicoptering and interfering in the in ongoing behavior, they, they're not allowing their dog to learn to resolve conflicts on their own, mm -hmm. you know, and which I think is really important. That I, I think that's such an interesting question on so many levels, because I think as a culture, we want all the bad stuff to go away. And trauma, of course, is something that we want to go away. And as myself, mm -hmm, a trauma survivor, mm -hmm. I can say that like, you know, it, it's, it stunk um, in so many ways, but was also a really important process. And I think we forget the kind of evolutionary roots of things like trauma and like, well, PTSD in response to trauma in terms yep. of how it was adaptive, yep. is adaptive for animals yep. and nature. Um, and so thinking about that, I guess I hesitate. I'm on the fence with that. I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of like, I have no idea whether that would be right. I guess I would try to measure what would the value of an intervention like that be depending on the level of dysfunction or distress the animal is experiencing following yep. that trauma. Um, Absolutely. Yep. It's, it, it's really interesting, Lena, though. Great question. Yeah, it is a great question. But I, I mean, that's what I was trying to say is... I think you got to evaluate each situation on its own. And if it looks like a dog is really whacked for whatever reason, then we should do all we can do to unwhack the dog, just like you might be uh, yeah. doing unwhacking the human yeah. for a human. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Great. Uh, Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Lena. Um, Linda, Brian, and then Cynthia, and then Michelle, just so I can remember the order there. Okay, one touch up really fast. Can Lena be our next featured guest? <laughs> Let me throw that out. Um, but you know, um, as we're going, we're talking a little bit on the side here on you know just, just the joy of dogness. You know, watching dogs be dogs. And as long as I've been in this field, uh, um, you know, just more and more, I just love watching dogs be dogs. And and I love watching my own dogs. And Mark, you have, I've read, I think I've read all of your books at least once, if not multiple times. I'm such a groupie. Um, but you talk about your own dogs. And I'm, I'm very curious uh, to ask you, you know, your own dogs, you know, do you pick specific dogs or breeds for yourself? And, and you know, do you do any training? I tend to be an on the fly type trainer. I just want my dogs to be out there in the world having fun and I deal with things as it goes on. Do you do any specific training with your dogs or how do you approach that? Well, I lived in the mountains for years and my dogs and, and some of the neighbor dogs up and down the road. I mean, you probably count on hand the number of times they had collars or leashes. They, they just, they just went out. We had, um, we had cougars, mountain lions, foxes, coyotes, black bears around. And in decades, not one negative, not one negative, if you will, harmful incident. Mm -hmm. I think part of it was a crapshoot. We were lucky. Part of it, I think the animals learned to respect who the animals, you know, the, they expect, they learned the danger of who these animals were. And they are, I mean, they're, 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 they're dangerous. Um, I never really, 
uh, only on one occasion um, with Jethro, a dog I rescued um, from the Boulder Valley Humane Society. Um, I never once formally trained these animals, but Jethro, um, and I don't know anything about his past at all, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, <coughs> would get off. Anytime somebody came to the door, he'd get up and bark and he was a big dog. I actually didn't mind it. I lived in the mountains and, you know, some weirdos come to your door. It's okay for my dog to run skid to the, skid to a stop in front of the door. <laughs> and most people just left. Um, but it was a pain and I couldn't get rid of it. So I called, I, I, I couldn't have him unlearn it. So I called the local dog trainer who, had, who knew what I did. She just laughed. She said, well, you should be able to do that. And I went, I have no idea what I'm doing. One trial learning, she stopped him. It, would, it would, might not be surprising. But my idea is that a lot of times these dogs got along together and, and, and had good lives is because they had so much control over their lives and, quote, agency. Mm -hmm. When I left, I had a bomb-proof outdoor run, a big one that was basically cougar and fox and black bear proof. And um, but they were but they were outside a lot, and not when I wasn't there, though. You know, but when I and I worked at home a lot, even when I taught at university. And I just think that they knew that they knew that if I confined them, I wasn't punishing them. And, but so many days when I was home, they were just on their own. And I would throw out, um, I would bury treats on my land. And they, they'd spend five hours looking for dog treats the size of a marble. I mean, you know, I mean, there was no nutritional value to it um, and stuff like that. So no, I never, I never formally, uh, I mean, there must've been some formality to it. But one thing I did because there were these wild predators around was I somehow got them to turn around and look at me when they were young. I'd just go, Jethro, Mother, Zeke. And I would put my hand in my right pocket where I always had treats. And they made that association really fast because dogs are food hounds, most of them. When my hand went down to my right pocket, no matter where they were, if they saw me, they came. It was really simple because I didn't want to yell, come and have a cougar be maybe even a half a mile away who could outrun them in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. So that was my form of training. And I guess that you break it down to, I was doing something regular and I was reinforcing them, you know, to coming to me. But, but you know, Mark, really that, that, that makes me think about something that we've talked about so much in this group, guys. And you probably all were thinking this when he was talking about the patterns in relationship earlier, right? We talk a lot about social relationships and the social environment here. And then we talk about reframing the valuable learning as what we call PPPs, so predictable patterns of precedent. So um, the idea that basically all animals are looking for PPPs, that's how they learn to navigate their world anyway, right? And so just by becoming predictable in our patterns, we are in essence training, not in the formal traditional yeah. sense that we're used to, but it's so amazing. Absolutely. I mean, I'd walk out of my house and if, I mean, I was convinced that if my, so, if my dogs and the other dogs on the road so I had a backpack on or a helmet because I was going to ride my bike down the canyon. The dog, the other dogs would go home. I mean, really, it would be, oh, Mark's leaving. We have to go home. Or they'd be, you know, shut up in the kennel. I don't mean it a bad one. They had a really nice kennel with a beautiful view. Um, but, but, and my dogs would do the same. And they would just say, oh, he's leaving. Yeah. They'd just get up and go into the outdoor run. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're right about that. And, and it done just pass. I mean, I think this question, you know, Linda asked it, right? Yeah. yeah. That, I mean, is really a good one because I really felt it was almost like with people, is if you we if you respect their individuality and you give them space to be who they are, they don't feel like you're trying to helicopter or control them. They feel safe mm -hmm. and they don't get pissed off that you're trying to control them. And or or you know, I know people who would oh, so-and-so didn't behave and I put them in the outdoor run. I'm going, shit, that's the worst you could ever do. I mean, they, you're, they know they're associating with being put in the outdoor run because they were, quote, bad. So it's no wonder that they run up, you know, where I live, they could run forever. 
no cars. It's no da- no surprise they'd run up the road when you'd say, come. Because <laughs> they're going, no, he's going to lock me up because I did something, quote, bad. I don't know what the bubble is in the head. So I do, I do think that it's a balance of giving, you know, other individuals, human uh, and otherwise, facing <laughs> and, 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 and that's what we did with the wild animals around. We came to respect them. Mm-hmm. And I only, I had a couple of incidents with cougars that I'd rather not have happen again. But I think I just learned who they were. They learned who I was. They, I learned their patterns. Mm-hmm. And I didn't walk at night. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, there were things I didn't do to honor the fact that these animals could outrun me and eat me in a heartbeat. Mm-hmm. But I think they came to re- respect. I, I do. I mean, I think they learned that I was not going to harm them. Um, and I was also going to take all measures to avoid them at any cost. And, 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 and you I, came to an agreement, basically, like indirectly, right? Like, yes. We, yeah. Yes. We negotiated an agreement. And I think that's what I was trying to say before that. I think the dogs on the road over a long period of time, because there were a lot of different dogs, somehow had that too. I mean, we really never had a, a negative, never, not one. And it, and there, it could have been a disaster. Mm-hmm. Um, um, so, I, so I think there's this thing between allowing another person the freedom to be who they are and they feel safe to be who they are or a dog. And then knowing that you can still ask them to do certain things that they might not want to do, but it's not like coming, a, you're not coming across like a control freak. Mm-hmm. So many people are control freaks in all contexts. Don't get me going. Um, <laughs> I'll shut up. <laughs> Done. <laughs> I, I have time for a few more questions. I've got to actually do something with a group in Brazil. In I was just going to ask how much time yeah. you had. I want to be yeah, respectful of, of your this time. This is great for me. And, and feel free to email me. And I'm going to want you, Kim, to email me the three Ps. Don't tell me it again because okay. my, no these problem. are my notes and, and they're not readable. So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm actually writing a book now and I'm almost done called De- Demystifying Dogs. And it's basically an A to Z encyclopedia of dog, all things dog. It's, re- and it's really exciting. My learning curve is vertical because <laughs> I'm learning a lot of the terminology and I am the methods of different training. Yeah. who I respect. I'm not writing about Cesar Milan and all the other yeah. horrific yeah. people. Um, but but feel free to email me stories too, because I can use stories. Yeah, no, we'll do. Um, okay, so we'll get, um, we'll at least get uh, Brian in and, and depending on how much time, we'll go down the line with Cynthia and Michelle um, and we'll, we'll try not to uh, take too much of Mark's time. But Brian, go ahead. Hey, Mark, thanks for coming on and talking you to bet us. You. Um, sure. I wanted pleasure. to ask you about kind of the trend in recent science towards reductionism and kind of looking for what I would say like Newton's laws of behavior, wherein we can just boil dogs down into some constant 100% predictable sort of formula um, and how most science just seems to kind of draw wild extrapolations off mean data that of course has tons of variability in it you know we see massive standard deviation error bars in a mm-hmm. lot of this data mm-hmm. that nobody really seems to be talking about um, or really interested in finding out what's going on there um so i wanted to kind of get your thoughts on that yeah no that's a great way to rephrase i think what i was starting with in terms of there not being one dog normalizing dog behavior and paying attention to Um, variability, if you will, you know, not being noise in the system, but rather being important data that, you know, why didn't a dog do something? Some of the dog studies I partook in, um, in, I I went to the big dog lab in Austria, and then I went to the one in Budapest, the uh, family dog project. Uh, They do good work and they do that kind of stuff. They pay attention to the individuality. Um, And, you know, reductionism is just a control mechanism. You know what I mean? It's just, it's just, you want to, you just want to reduce everything down to something that's highly predictable. And I can't imagine that being a dog trainer would ever lend itself to that. But, but I do know there were trainers out here who were very reductionist. You know, you just, 
I haven't, but I know people who you describe, you describe a situation and they come up with some explanation that's, if you will, normalizing it, but paying no attention to the dog, the human or the dog um, human relationship. Um, and, and, you know, statistics are descriptive and I, I'm, I'm happy to go along with trends, but, you know, um, one of the things I've been focusing on a lot is, you know, dogs versus wolves, do dogs follow human pointing and gaze? You know, some people will say dogs do it and, and wolves don't, but that's just not true. Mm. And, and I spend time talking to the people who do this research. There are no generalizations, but then people go berserk and during conclusions about the role of domestication of why dogs should do something that dogs should do or do something that wolves shouldn't or don't do. And then all of a sudden somebody raises wolves in a certain way and, dog, and they do it. So the reason I'm picking that as an example is because I partook in those, some of those studies in Budapest with um, Adam McCloskey and his group. They do really good work. And a lot of them are trained in ethology. And I think that helps them. They're really trained to watch animals and they pay very close attention to, if you will, the outliers, the animals who don't fall into that normative pool. I don't, I don't know if that answers your question, but that was what I was trying to get away from is reductionism. Mm -hmm. It just takes, I mean, to me, reductionism takes all the heart out of science. It just, it just takes everything out of it. It just like makes it boring, you know? Um, does, that, does that help you along? <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's kind of the emotional pulse that uh, a lot of trainers are kind of shifting towards, you know, um, appreciating the, the variability in the science rather than trying to get rid of it. Right. I mean, it makes it makes life hard um, because there's no one size fits all explanation. But what you just said is something I always say is the science supports that kind of, if you will, idiosyncratic view. Mm -hmm. The science supports looking at dogs as individuals. So, but the problem is, is number one, like I said before, you know, you get these situations where you, you do the good science, a handful of dogs are studied, some do this, some do that, more do X than Y. And then the conclusion is dogs do X. <laughs> and I'm going, really? <laughs> I mean, that was the whole basis. I mean, it really what led to our eight and a half year field study of coyotes one aspect was looking at individual differences and how that translated into behavior later on for wild individuals. It wasn't easy, but that was really what motivated it, that um, individual differences that you would see among litter mates and siblings played some role in the later behavior of these animals, which it did. And, you know, what we more limited, um, we were more limited than, of course, if you did the study in the lab, but you couldn't do it in the lab. I mean, these animals could go all over hell outside of Jackson, Wyoming, and we were tracking them for miles and miles and miles. But we did learn that what happens a lot early in life or their behavioral phenotype or behavioral profile early in life played a role later in life. Mm -hmm. And it was fun. It was hard work, but it was fun being out in the Grand Tetons. Well, Mark, I know um, a bunch of people are, you know, of course, wishing we had five more hours. And one of the questions I just got in the chat is, is it okay for them to email you? Yeah, that's yes. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. All right. Well, I will share Mark's email. With Only the if they're positive. I don't yeah. want, I, I don't have any room now for, we don't have any room for negative. Actually, we our number one rule in this group is check your ego at the door or bye-bye. Yeah, good. Yeah. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> uh, I'm, no, I mean, I, I have no doubt that things I'm saying have different interpretations and could be sometimes flat wrong, but I, I work with the governor of the state um, really closely on animal welfare protection issues. And we're going through a shit storm here, mm -hmm. cutting through the chase. It's, and I don't have any more, I, my, the one fraction of my brain that's open to negativity is full. <laughs> so, <laughs> I hear that I, and I I'm echo telling my it. Friends, yeah. Stay away from me today yeah. if you have yeah. anything that you want to say. It's oh, negative. I not in this group. No, Th uh, this group's going to no. have some good questions. And just no, this wanna... is great. And no, thank you. I, I mean, I have a yeah. good feeling for all of you based on my interactions with Kim and the questions that you're asking. So, yeah, no, I mean, I, I just think that I, 
my learning curve writing this new book has been vertical, getting into a lot of different areas and training and uh, veterinary medicine and dogs and culture. I mean, in retrospect, I think if I knew it was going to be like that, I probably I might have said no, <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm 100,000 words into it. So there's no way I'm saying no. Um, but no, send me stories or ask questions. I, um, I, I really um, I, I really would like to. Um, I really want in, um, input from informed people. And one of the things you can do, but if you do this, I need to ask you to send it in a separate email. And I and Kim knows about it. So um, I've got <clears throat> I've been asking people to send me two or three questions that they want. They would ask their dog or a dog, and then two or three questions that they think their dog would ask them or what their dog thinks of them. So mm -hmm. sort of flipping it around. And, um, and I'll just be honest with you. Um, um, what's his name? Oh, Paul McCartney of the Beatles. Um, so no, seriously, he's a dog lover. He sent me the most amazing stories about some of his dogs. Really? I mean, and the, and the questions he would ask them. I mean, um, and uh, Joan Baez, who's a singer, yeah. Some of you may have heard of her. So she's actually done some original drawings for my new book. She's a oh, phenomenal artist. And she, lo awesome. she, she, she loves dogs. She, she just, she loves dogs. And we can talk all the time about dogs. Um, and so she also, and then Emmy Lou Harris, who's a good singer. Yeah. She, people don't know, <laughs> she runs, maybe you all know, because I don't know where you all are, but she lives in Nashville and she's got a dog rescue center called Bonaparte's Retreat right on her right right on her house property. Oh wow, that's awesome. I had no idea. Yeah, she rescues um only old dogs. Oh. And 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 Emmy Lou sent me, I mean, we talked a lot about this, but she sent me these questions. And, and what's really cool about it, and I'm just saying this is not that these people are famous or anything like that, it is their heart. I mean, they're, I mean, Paul McCartney's story about his dogs could make you cry. It's not surprising because he's right. a girl vegan and all that. But, but, but um, I would love to hear some of your, um, the questions you would ask a dog or that you think they would ask you or are asking you. <laughs> like, why are you doing this? Treat me better. I'm a damn dog. You know, I like to put my nose into places that you don't like. Too blanking bad. Anyway, if you if you want to send me those, um, do send them as a separate email and maybe yeah. in the subject line, just say questions for your book because okay. they, they do come in. But I'll, I would, I'll send all those that uh, you sent them in a previous email. So I'll just recap them, post them to the group, put in there your email, tell folks they can email you with those answers and that subject line or anything else. You'll yeah. probably get swamped with interesting, amazing conversations and people, but that's okay. You asked for it. No, that's okay. Just be really succinct. Um, some people sent me like two pages explaining <laughs> their question. I don't have room for that. Right, right. Um, but, but, but they do home in on certain things like, you know, am I taking care of you? Um, you know, am I doing, am I giving you a good life or, you know, with abandoned dogs, why did somebody give you up? Mm. You know, what, what was it about? Yeah, I know. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's really interesting. Paul McCartney said he just wants to know why in the world somebody gave up this dog named Rose, who's his family's heart and soul, mm. you know, and because because you can't ask them why they came into your life. Mm -hmm. So. So, yeah. And, and stuff. Yeah, I, I, I can handle emails. Good. And We'll be kind and appreciative of your time there too, as well as we're trying to be here. Although I know we're well past the hour, Mark, you've been so generous yes. and I know everyone is so grateful that you joined us today. Thank you again. I have to practice my Spanish now or Portuguese. No, I don't. I told them I don't speak Portuguese. So that's <laughs> fine. Um, well, thank you all. And I really um, appreciate having new friends in the world. Um, yes. Thank you. And do send me stuff and we'll come back. Great. Uh, I'd these love to have my, you again. These are my favorite types of things. Giving lectures, it's just so boring. Just yeah. um, <laughs> but, um, but these exchanges are really important. So thank you. Oh, absolutely. Thank you again, Great. guys. We'll post the recording later for everyone to rewatch it. And we'll see you on the group and talk soon. Would you send me the link? I, I will. Yes. yes. 
Yeah, Go. absolutely. Thank you, Go. Mark. Okay. Have a good okay. one.